My name is Eddie Cook. I am the Maricopa County Assessor. I want to welcome all of our our friends that are online and joining this particular call. It um, is a true honor to um, be able to speak with you and have my uh, A team here on the call help uh, with the presentation and be able to answer any questions with you. Um, um, this is my first time actually getting to meet with you and chat with you and I look forward to a, a collaborative discussion between both our teams so that we get to know you, but you also get to know us a little better as well. So um, part of any kind of virtual call is I would just ask that each of us um, mute your uh, your either your phone or your computer so that um, uh, we won't be interrupted uh, uh, with uh, maybe any unnecessary chatter or unexpected sounds, but that would be so kind. But um, uh, anyways, uh, I have now been in the assessor's office for literally one year. So a year ago, last February, I had the privilege of um, being appointed by the Maricopa uh, County Board of Supervisors to uh, backfill a vacancy here in our office. So prior to becoming the assessor, uh, I had served as a council member on the Gilbert Town Council for nine years. And um, uh, during that time, right before I, I resigned, I was serving as the vice mayor in, in the town of Gilbert and so forth. And uh, I've been involved in uh, numerous um, uh, roles uh, of leadership throughout Maricopa County uh, while serving on uh, domestic violence councils, uh, a water board. The, I was I'm appointed with the governor's uh, IT board and so forth. So again, just a, a lot of variety of different um, boards that I have served while being on the Gilbert Town Council with that. On my team, if we go to the next slide, Adam, um, th these are the folks on my team that um, uh, are the uh, fantastic leaders that I have that help run the organization. So uh, Don Marie Buckland is our Chief Deputy Assessor. Uh, Leslie Kratz is the Assistant Chief Deputy Assessor. Tracy Johnson uh, will not be joining us today due to some um, other um, family concerns that she's dealing with. She's our chief appraiser. Uh, Alejandro Larios is my chief of staff. Mark Kramer uh, is my chief innovation of technology, like my CTO, and Molly Rogers, director of litigation. Next slide. And then I have a, a whole other team of folks that are on this call uh, that are a lot of our uh, subject matter experts uh, in the assessor's office right there. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to share with you is, um, is what is the role of the county assessor? And the one question or comment that I get from the public a lot is that I'm the bad guy who collects your taxes. And I said, no, I'm not the bad guy that collects your taxes. It's the other guy. That's the treasurer. He collects your taxes. He's the bad guy. So anyways, we have a lot of fun with that uh, because a lot of times, you know, every year, uh, every property owner here in the state of Arizona gets some type of communication uh, the notice evaluation from their county assessor so the county assessor's role is this to truly and fairly determine the evaluation without favor or partiality of all the taxable property in maricopa county or all the counties in the uh, state of arizona there's 15 of them at its full cash value that is the most simplistic um, definition of what our office does is to do just this statement. And 
uh, look at our office is literally executing on the Arizona Constitution and the state statutes surrounding uh, basically property taxes and the way property taxes uh, is determined is from the uh, valuation that our office um, calculates. And all the complex math and all the statistical analysis and all of the market values and all that, my team of experts are there to basically do this statement, is just to determine the um, valuation of taxable property. That's it, very, very simple. Now, the taxable, the, the, the property tax statutes and laws in Arizona are complex and there are many of them and many of you know them really really well uh, i'm i take a position of simplification because i like that and i wish our our tax codes for property taxes was much simpler and easier and less complicated but that's for other um, individuals that are in as policymakers to uh, figure that out that's not my office. Our office is to execute on either good or bad policy, but we do it really well. And uh, and we are here to educate uh, all stakeholders in this process as to you know what that might be. But again, we're not in the role of of creating policy. Our office is in the role of executing um, policy with that. So basically, we have a mission and vision statement here. And the way I like to look at it is, is that um, uh, it's important for our office to be able to uh, have the best customer service that we can as, a res as it relates to the evaluation of, of property. And, uh, and what we like to do is that um, we looked at our office as a very collaborative office, one that uh, wants to work with all stakeholders as it relates to evaluation of, of property and uh, and that's kind of the the direction that we're doing here in, in the office next slide please so let's talk about the 2022 valuations and i think with that I believe, Adam, I turn this over to one of our team members, I think. Correct. Uba? Yes, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is, is Uba Hova, and I'm part of the team of modelers responsible for the development of our tax year 2022 full cash values. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've done one of these. I think the last time, if I remember correctly, uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, Auditorium, probably tax year 2016. So nice to see everybody represented by a circle on the bottom of my screen here. So uh, so let's get started. Let's talk about uh, my portion of this presentation. It's going to consist of a high level overview of our tax year 2022 full cash value changes. And we're also going to look at the historical market trends for commercial vacant land and multifamily properties. But uh, let's get started by taking a look at our current inventory of property in Maricopa County. Um, not surprisingly, most of our properties, about 80%, are represented by single family residential, coming in at 1.3 million parcels. Uh, we have 190,000 vacant land parcels. Uh, just under 72,000 commercial properties, 37,000 mobile homes, 30,500 apartments, and just under 13,000 agricultural. Uh, in addition, we also have uh, 165,000 uh, business personal property accounts. All right, so let's move on to our median values. Uh, so this table is basically giving an overview of what our change in median full cash value is, and also what our change in limited, the median limited property value. So if we start with vacant land, 
our full cash value, our median full cash value, and it's important to note that, increased 11% uh, from 39,000 to 43,300. Single family residential uh, increased to 269,000, an increase of 7.6%. Uh, condos, 8.5%. Uh, apartments, 15.4. Uh, this is probably the category that we've been going up the most in terms of double digit increases over the past uh, number of tax years. Our commercial property, a fairly small increase this year, 2.1%. Uh, as a respect, respect to the change in median value and mobile homes, manufactured housing, increase of 5.4%. And not surprisingly, most of our limited property values uh, increase at the max amount of 5%. On the okay, onward and upward. So if we were to look at uh, previous summary in a historical context, um, we're basically for single family condominiums, apartments, and commercial, we're at our all time high for median full cash value. Um, I used tax year 2008 as reference because that was the previous high prior to uh, the housing bubble that we started in 2009. Uh, vacant land and manufactured housing were not at the peaks as we were previously in 2008 and 2009 tax years but we are, it is starting to get close, but it just puts into perspective where our median values are. It doesn't specifically talk about any particular type of property. We're looking at this from a very high level with respect to the overall median values. All right. Commercial construction. So this is our inventory of commercial properties uh, in 2020. We had, as of right now, I mean, our inventory changes daily, but at the time when I created uh, this uh, table, uh, this chart, sorry, there was 366 new commercial properties that were added in 2020. Um, it's been pretty steady over the last four to five years. I anticipate that number will increase as we go through our notice of change, but Nowhere near where we were in the period of 2004 through 2007. Our max amount was 2854. Uh, it is somewhat misleading because the over half of the properties that were added, uh, commercial properties that is from 2000, about 2003 to 2007, were actually commercial condos. So that's heavily weighted in that particular category. All right, next slide. Commercial sales, probably not a huge surprise here. We did drop approximately 20% in overall sale volume uh, from 2019. Uh, we had been, you know, over averaging about 2,000, 2,100 sales for the past four to five years. This year we're down uh, about 20% on our overall inventory of commercial sales. Again, that number is going to change slightly. I don't know if we'll get to 2,000 or not, but uh, it's looking like we're down about it. By the time everything comes in, we're probably be down about between 15 and 20 percent relative to the prior year on commercial sale inventory. Commercial property sale price per square foot. Although our sale inventory is actually lower, our overall commercial sale price per square foot, when we're looking at it on the median, again, this represents the midpoint doesn't represent any particular category, but on average, you know, it's been a steadily, steadily climbing since, you know, our, our bottom in you know, first quarter of 2011. And it's been going pretty steady ever since then. I mean, right now our median per square foot for commercial property is about $180 per square foot. And again, that represents the median across all commercial property types. Okay, so let's look at commercial a little. Let's break it down into a little more detail. So this is a representation of our median percent change for commercial property type by our two digit use code. Um, as you can see, most categories, the increase is fairly nominal or for the most part, no change at all. Uh, overall, the median percent. Now I'm talking about median percent change as opposed to change in median value here. 
but overall uh, increasing about a percent. Uh, what probably should stand out there is our resorts and included in that category would be our larger hotels. Uh, we're dropping on average about 37% in that particular category. Okay, move on to vacant land. Vacant land is actually the only category that increased in terms of our sale count. And I say increased because last time I looked at it, it was higher than in 2018. I just have not updated the slide yet. So commercial, vac uh, actually vacant land sales across the board have been fairly consistent in the past uh, number of years. So I will say if we look, if we were to separate that between residential and commercial, commercial sale counts, commercial vacant land sale counts have actually gone down while residential has increased. Next slide, please. So as far as vacant land, median price per square foot, commercial has been fairly steady, about $8 per square foot over the past uh, four to five years. The residential, it's, it's a little bit misleading. It's showing residential price per square foot, median residential price per square foot that is actually dropping. It's actually, what, what's being represented here is an actual change in where the majority of the property of vacant land is being sold. We're actually having a higher concentration of vacant land sales on uh, in the west part of the county, which is ultimately pushing down the median price per square foot since the land values are actually lower in that portion of the county. Oh. Next slide, please. Permanent sales. So we have this broken down by our two to 12 units and our 13 units and up. Uh, we make this breakdown because that's how we actually value them. Our two to 12 unit apartments that are valued in a separate model than our 13 plus units. So for two to 12, our full cash value change or with respect to the median is 17%. For apartments that are over 13 units, uh, our increase is just under 10%. And this is where the largest drop in our actual sales are. Uh, we had about a 30% drop in our larger apartment sales from 2019 to, to 2020. Next slide. Uh, although we have a smaller number of sales, our price per square foot, actually our median sale price for our two to 12 units have been going up very steadily since uh, 2010. Our median price uh, for a two to 12 unit apartment in 2020 is about $400,000, 460,000, sorry. Next slide, please. And apartments, we keep going up. Um, despite the lower sale count, uh, in 2020, we're looking at about a uh, median price per unit of 155,000 which is about 100,000 more than we were uh, first quarter of the uh, latter part of 2015, first quarter of 2016. So apartment sales, price per unit, median price per unit uh, has continuing to go up pretty steadily over the past 10 years, actually. All right, next slide, please. Okay, just as an overview, I mentioned previously, I'm part of the team who developed the valuation models for the Maricopa County Assessor's Office. Um, each year we build about 75 models. Most of those are kind of dominated by residential and condo because they're the most parcels. Um, but the, the approach that we use for residential condo vacant land, uh, two to 12 unit apartments, all market. We also have some smaller commercial models. We have a commercial condo model a warehouse industrial model, and a market model for offices that are less than 22,000 square feet. Uh, our apartments that are greater than 13 units are uh, valued using an income approach, and our appraisal group uh, has a model for hotels and resorts that are over 200 rooms. Now, anyone who would, would have gone to some of the prior presentations that we used to do over at the Board of Supervisors um, Auditorium, the slide's pretty much the same. The only addition to this is I don't think at the time we were doing offices, uh, our smaller offices or offices less than 20,000 square feet. All remaining property types 
are valued using the cost approach. That's a good segue. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Um, just a reminder, when it comes to the cost approach, we do have uh, for what we call commercial cost submarket adjustments. Uh, we used to use them uh, quite frequently when we were coming out of the recession. Uh, right now, we only have two categories where we're actually applying a submarket adjustment. And the first category is offices that are um, less than 10,000 square feet. There's a submarket adjustment of 10%, which is a negative adjustment uh, that's applied to the cost improvement value only. And the other category is offices that are greater than 10 square 10,000 square feet. We have a submarket schedule that's based on the age of the property of the property. Sorry. So that's just a couple of reminders for tax year 2022. Um, and like I say, the slides that I provide just kind of a high level overview of some of our value changes, some of our trends that we're seeing in the market. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to respond if I can. So, and that's pretty much it for my part. Thank well, you. thank you, Mr. Hoff, very much for your expertise and sharing that. Um, this is a time, an opportunity for uh, you folks that are joining the call. If you have any questions, we'll take a little bit of time here before we go into our next presentation. But if you have any questions, uh, unmute your mic and um, and we'll we have a team of subject matter experts ready to go to answer. Well, I'm so thrilled that it was extremely clear on the content that we just presented. So again, any questions from anyone that are in, in, in uh, on the presentation here? Hi, Mr. Cook. Well, this hello. Is, hi, this is Kim Deloney with Ryan. How are you, sir? Doing well. Hey, I just had one question, a clarification, if I could, please. Uh, on the presentation that was just shared with us, was the submarket adjustment for the office properties a positive or a negative adjustment? Thank you for your question. I will turn it over to one of my team members. Thank you. That's a very good question. And because it's not clear when you look at the slide, it's it's 10%, but it is a, actually a negative adjustment. So 10% is getting removed from the cost. So it is a negative adjustment. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you in a virtual forum here. Uh, Mark Kramer, uh, Chief Technology Officer with uh, the Assessor's Office and uh, uh, new to the team and about nine months ago and um, uh, just really excited to get in, involved in a part of the, the industry here. Um, and I'll be talking about appeals. So uh, we're getting our notices of values out, uh, which will be the start then of the appeal season uh, starting on February 26th. Uh, and extending then through April 27th. And uh, very excited to talk to you today about a, uh, a pilot uh, application that we have out there for completing appeals uh, online. So uh, we'll be going through through that just a couple of slides today. Uh, starting then Friday morning, um, you'll be able to access our new system uh, right there from that appeals link that's uh, circled in the upper right uh, corner on this slide, which is from the uh, Maricopa County's uh, homepage. So go ahead there, Adam, to get the next one. Um, the goal of the new appeal system is to accommodate both uh, residential and commercial appeals uh, and to take the entire application um, online, uh, including uh, supplemental documents, uh, signatures, and, and so on. Um, the general theme, if, if you're a TurboTax user, uh, you know, we've, we've modeled the experience somewhat around that, where um, uh, we really prompt you through the process, ask a number of questions, uh, collect your answers, compile the uh, petition document at the end, um, 
and, and ask for signature uh, using DocuSign. So um, go ahead, Adam, to the, the next slide there. Uh, in, in terms of uh, what we hope to be and plan to be advantages uh, for our community and, and for our own team here is to really uh, capitalize on a number of efficiencies of, of capturing the data and trying to reduce the amount of uh, keystrokes uh, for all parties involved. So uh, I'm going to highlight just a, a couple of uh, you know points that we find that we hope you're very um, uh, you're very um, uh, uh, receiving to. So uh, entering parcel numbers. Uh, if you if you enter in parcel numbers, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yes, we can. All right. Good. Um, Entering in parcel numbers will query our back office systems and populate the uh, the forms for you. Uh, similar, the full cash value and the LPV information, legal class information um, that is needed for the forms will be queried from our back office systems and populated. Um, you'll be prompted for some agent information. If you're filling uh, multiple uh, appeals out, uh, your your contact information will be carried over from submittal to submittal. Um, su uh, supporting documents, uh, additional DUR forms, uh, there will be prompts and ability to upload those too as part of the integral process. So the goal is to capture everything needed in in one uh, in one shot. Um, and depending on all the different routes, we've really mapped the process a lot, uh, depending on the type of property and, and, uh, and how you're um, appealing, you'll get prompted for the information needed. And uh, at the end of the day, our, our goal is really to um, have an efficient process that uh, we can capture everything up front and um, process it through. Uh, and at the end of that process, uh, you'll be, um, it will complete with an email uh, with a copy of the uh, DocuSign uh, petition that you submitted. And that uh, uh, we're hoping, like I said, uh, hoping that that really is a streamlined process for, for all of you submitting. Um, we, of course, on the, and the back office will also um, uh, be receiving that digitally and uh, able to speed up our back office processes as well. So, yeah, stop there for a bit and see once uh, if we have any any questions. Mark, we have uh, we have a question in the chat. I'll read it to you. Uh, okay. Will DOR income forms be the be filled through the system, or user need to pre-fill and upload to the appeal system? Sure, great question. So, when you get to the DOR income forms, um, you the prompt will ask you to fill out the forms. It will have a link. Uh, to the DOR website so that it's convenient to download the form. We'd ask that you download it, complete it, and then upload the completed form oh, wow. that step. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. And then, and, and again, that will all then flow through as one uh, application package to, to our team. Okay. So, so Mark, if I can just add one thing there, sure. the DOR, you know, the DOR forms that are accessible and linkable through that appeal portal, uh, that will not take place of the notarization process. So that will still need to take place outside of the system. And I think that was that next question there. I think Jason, yeah. you just hit that. Uh, run in between the, the question, can the owner uh, make address or name changes if different from the record when filing online? Uh, so Jason or Socorro, um, we do allow for separate contact information for handling of the correspondence for the appeal uh, as part of the application process. Don't know that that answers that question directly, however. So I believe the form, the current DOR form allows you to check it if it's changed ownership. You would have to provide a copy of the recorded document. And then once it comes through the system, we would have to take it through the process that needs to be done before we can change the name on the property. 
does that answer the question? One more question and we'll get back to it if it didn't. Uh, where does the owner select the basis for the appeal? Uh, the, the basis of appeal two will be uh, be one of the prompts. Um, so depending on the uh, basis that you select, then you'll get prompted for additional supporting information or, um, you know, free form comments uh, for that basis. Mark, will each agent have a dashboard to review all appeals or is this the only uh, only a submittal system? Yeah, uh, I, I love where you're going with that. And uh, we're for for this year, it will be largely an intake system. Uh, you, you will find after uh, you submit that there is an area where you can view your appeals. And uh, if you needed a copy of your um, appeal uh, petition that you could download it. Um, it is it is built on a platform um, that can accommodate those uh, those portions, although it's not part of our pilot this year. Um, we we had to hustle to really get everything ready for this year as it is. Um, we are hoping um, to to go down those avenues in in future years. OK. Um, so, so depending on uh, how uh, where the the audience here wants to go, um, I I don't have the live system ready to pull up, but I, I do have a a PowerPoint with just kind of some screenshots. If uh, you would like to, um, if you'd like to just get a flavor of it, um, and then of course Friday morning you all have access to jump in and see it through. One more question, Mark, before you get to that. Is this system for informal as well as board appeals? This would be just for the just for the assessor informal appeals. Okay. One more question. If you fill out your petition form outside of the system and have your petition package in a PDF, is there a way to just upload it? Yeah, thank thank you for that. Uh, the uh, the email that we allowed last year for submitting PDF uh, applications will still uh, be out there. Although, you know, we really encourage you to use the new system as we think that it will um, will save you a good bit of typing and research. Um, to fill out the applications, but if, if maybe you have one done already and you don't want to, you know, key it again, um, you, you can send it over same means as last year or reach out to us and, and we'll work something out with you. Okay. That's all the question. One more question. Which type of appeals will be supported? Sure. Uh, residential. Uh, commercial, agriculture, and land um, appeals will all be accommodated through this system. About notice of claim or notice of change. <laughs> I, I love the way y'all are thinking. Um, we don't we don't have notice of claim or notice of change at this time, but uh, you know we're putting this pilot out and wanting to learn from it and. Um, you know, take take the things that we find work and then uh, we'll expand into that in, in a bigger conversation for the assessor's office. We've uh, really this is the first significant step in a digital first journey where we can begin to think about accommodating all business in a digital transaction first. Um, that, of course, is a journey. It will take a little time to get those things um, accomplished, but that's that's uh, direction wise where we're looking to go. So if I may chime in. <clears throat> sure, I agree with everything that Mark mentioned as far as notice of claims, uh, but I'd like to remind the, the tax agents that a notice of change is not filed with the assessor's office. It's filed with state board. So just a friendly reminder. All right. This is also a pilot, so we're going to try and see how it works out. 
before we try and move on to the next level, which should be notice of claims possibly. And, and with that in mind, uh, you know, encourage you guys to reach out and provide feedback to us as you use the system. Um, we've put it through, uh, you know, good bit of strenuous testing, both automated and, and our own teams. Um, but of course, um, you know, the more input we can get from from you as a user community, the more we can try to improve it um, over time and learn for our next engagements. One more question, Mark. Is the data entry screen in lieu of filling out a hard copy of the appeal form and will SBOE accept that electronic filing? Great, great question. Uh, it is in lieu of filling out the hard copy um, and the uh, the electronic receipt that you receive and the attachment that's on it uh, uses DocuSign technology and you will find that it looks, uh, I'm not going to say identical because there are a few words and, and spaces that are different, uh, but it is uh, very much the same as the SBOE uh, or the, the standard form. Um, and we expect SBOE to, to accept that uh, filing. All right. Okay, Mark, were you going to bring up your presentation? Yeah, I was going to say, let me let me okay. uh, hang on one second. I didn't have that one queued, so it'll take me just a moment. You all see in my screen OK? Yep. Perfect. OK. Um, and, and these are screenshots that I took. Uh, this is uh, this is these are screenshots from a residential appeal. Uh, you'll see some options as I go through this and, and really um, in what I'm trying to present you. I'm trying to give you a flavor and a feel for the system, uh, not necessarily a um, you know 100 percent walkthrough of each and every step. Um, but uh, you'll first get prompted for your type of appeal. You'll notice that you have directions over here. So the full set of residential instructions and commercial instructions are available on all screens uh, throughout the process. Uh, you'll get asked to acknowledge the same uh, acknowledgments and in, in terms as you have previously. Um, information about who is appealing the property. So if you're the property owner, of course, you, you can select this option. If it's agent, you will get prompted and asked for agent uh, information and, and uh, confirmation. Um, and if you're selecting a single or multiple parcels, so this is a really good um, you know, item to have uh, ready. Uh, if it is multiple parcels, uh, you'll get uh, it will trigger a new system, a new portion of the workflow. Uh, and you'll get prompted then for information on each of the parcels that's part of that appeal. Um, you'll enter your parcel number. So um, if you're if you're working with an address, um, we have the exit the assessors link here on the website. You can click on that. It will open up a separate tab. You can search by address, find your parcel number um, and bring it back and plug it in. Um, admittedly, this is an area that um, we would like to, to beef up a little bit in a future year uh, such that we can do a direct address search right here. Um, but that's uh, in, in the time frame we had, we didn't feel like we could pull that together dependably uh, for this season. So, but that's on our to-do list. Um, and that would be a good example of something that in future years, if you find, or as you use the system this year, you find something like that would say, hey, you know, if we can do it this way, it would help us a lot. Um, that's, would love to hear that stuff. Um, it will pull back all that information then based on the parcel um, and it will populate all of that into the form for you. Um, you have some options down here about different owner addresses and so on. Um, and then here are your, your options for basis of appeal. So um, you can select one or more of these options, put in your justifications for each. If you have supporting documents, you can upload those as supporting documents. 
um, you'll get prompted here. This is I, I, this is actually one long form for the sake of presentation. I have it divvied up left to right, uh, but you'll get prompted for your opinion of, of values. Um, again, any supporting documents to upload, uh, and then you'll get to a point where you're going to get a notification that you're about to um, about to pull up the, the signature form and, and you're actually getting passed. So all of your data has been passed to DocuSign and this is the rendering of the petition. And as you can see, it's very similar to uh, the standard uh, petition. And you'll sign it electronically. Um, and then at the point of signature, uh, you will receive an email from the account that you created with that uh, attachment included. Mark, one more question. What about multiple parcel appeals and the total number of parcels? So uh, multiple parcel appeals, uh, the, the system, uh, you know, in, in IT speak, there's a one to many relationship between the appeal and the, and the parcel, which means you can add as many parcels um, as you as you need to. Um, I know, you know, I, I only tested up to 10, but this is something that we went through with the development effort was, you know, how many can we do? Um, you can keep adding them as, as many as you have. Um, there is a, a pause button that you might have seen uh, in those screenshots. Uh, that is essentially like, a, think of it kind of like a save button um, that uh, if you're putting in, you know, 50 or more or something, you might want to punch that every now and then just for the sake of, uh, um, you know, not losing your spot. Um, okay. Let's see what's here. All right. I hope you all. Um, I I hope you're uh, you know as excited for this as we are here. Uh, we really think that this is an improvement and a step forward um, and the goal is to put something out there that again is is uh, less work for all of you and uh, brings everything in a digital form that uh, that also helps us so um, again you know feed, feedback's a gift and welcome uh, along the way well thank you mr kramer for sharing with our friends here about our kind of a new appeals process. Um, part of uh, uh, my leadership team uh, in coming on board as the assessor was to uh, look at a lot of our uses of technology here in the assessor's office and to um, uh, begin what we call our digital first initiative. There are many of these um, technologies that we believe that will be a benefit to the, the public as well as ourselves and and making sure that uh, the data is accurate and available and that uh, it's also easy accessible to to the public as well so this is just one of uh, newer processes using technology that is forthcoming and i'm extremely grateful for uh, my team's uh, innovation and partnership with a lot of the vendors um, to help us propel us into the 21st century with, with technology. So are there any other additional questions related to appeals? With that, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, this is one of the topics that uh, has been uh, around for a number of years, even before my time in joining the assessor's office, and that's to talk about um, the Mars project. And the Mars project, um, just to give you a high level overview, um, is, uh, well, think about it this way. Uh, all of the, uh, all of the, um, valuation that we do in calculating all that complex math is done on a calculator that was built back in the 1990s. So we are in the process for the last uh, five plus years of making a new calculator and that calculator uh, is more 21st 
century based. And uh, uh, when when I came on board, uh, we looked at the the process over the last five years and implemented some new strategic plans and strategies uh, in getting the project uh, moving forward and getting it completed here within the next 12 months. So anyways, that's called the Mars Project. I'm going to now turn this back over to Mr. Kramer to talk about where we're at with the Mars Project. Perfect. Um, thank you, Eddie. Um, for sure, uh, Mars, another um, really significant technology initiative for the office here. And as Eddie said, uh, um, planning uh, a go live in February of, of 2022. Um, and uh, completely modernizing, as, as Eddie said, from a, a system that was invested in really in about 30 years ago and has served uh, its, its service um, in looking to modernize um, both the software as well as, as the platform that it resides on. Um, and so this is a sneak peek of the, uh, the interface, uh, all web-based um, uh, product and a map-centric product. As you can imagine, nearly everything we do um, is an interaction with a map and, and something that resides at a, a point in space. Um, could you hit the next slide there, Adam? Uh, so uh, one of the big items that we're looking uh, as an office to get out of this along with sustainability of, of technology is um, to build in a, a lot of workflow management tools um, that will allow us to, um, you know, just stay on top of the, the large volume of activity and building and construction um, and, and value changes that are happening within uh, properties within the county. And so that's a big effort um, where a lot of the new pieces are involved um, and integrating a little more tightly with the way that our modeling team works and the way that our source data works um, so that we can again streamline um, activities within the office. Uh, and I think we have one more item there, modernizing. Um, so to put a little more detail to the modernizing comment, um, uh, this will be a fully hosted Microsoft um, Azure cloud hosted application when we get done. Um, that really in a technology sense is the jumping off point by which to do um, all the things that cloud services um, allow an organization to do. Um, and, and it brings with it a certain amount of continuous um, evolving technology platforms that are carried largely by, in this case, Microsoft. So I'm very excited to, to see this come to fruition. Uh, very thankful for many members of the team here in the, in the office that have been dedicating you know, a few years of, of their career to getting this uh, process built along with the partnership with um, Esri Canada, who is our, our vendor to build this. Um, to tie this together with how and when this touches the community, um, tax year 2023 notice of values uh, will be sent, uh, produced and sent from the system that we've been using, uh, the legacy system. Um, and then the tax year 2023 uh, appeals would be processed in the new system. So uh, just almost today to the date uh, is when our go live is a year from now. So um, that's when we expect all of this uh, change to happen within our back office. Um, in terms of, of online uh, interface or user experience or, or whatnot, um, I, I don't think you'll see a direct touch to the MAR system um, uh, from your seats. Um, you, it will be largely the you know interactions that we have, but we will be built on technologies that will open up um, opportunities into the future um, that we, we hope and we plan to bring forward through through that digital first analysis uh, initiative to the community. Let's Mark, see. one question in the chat. Uh, will parcel history be included? I know that the data conversion includes, I believe, seven years back of, uh, of uh, tax year history. Um, that's, uh, do, do we have, I think I saw earlier that we have Steve on the phone, on the call with us. Uh, do we? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Steve. Could, could anything to add to that? 
Yeah, Chris, the, all, uh, all of the existing parcel history that exists in 6i for all years are being migrated over, um, regardless of the, the seven years of actual tabular data we're carrying, all of the notes are coming over. Any other further questions from our friends that are on the on the on the presentation? Yeah, this particular project is a tremendous uh, lift for us. It's it is a uh, unique uh, technology uh, that is specifically um, being developed for Maricopa County, and uh, there's a lot of innovations and uh, features in this technology that is tremendously going to improve a lot of our internal business processes. Um, uh, I cannot share with you uh, the amount of systems that we use today with the current legacy system um, that has been you know, in our office for, for many, many years. Uh, part of our digital first initiative was really to again take advantage of technologies to improve our own processes, um, uh, making everything uh, as clean as as air free as possible and accurate as possible. But uh, eventually, there's going to be a lot of deliverables that I envision that will that will be able to pro provide to the public. Uh, from a come from a we'll call it a, da a data portal that the public can get access to uh, certain amounts of trending data and all that based upon you know what we collect and so forth. But again, a significant project, many many uh, hours of uh, team members you know that's worked on it for for years. Uh, we're about 12 months away from from actually uh, cracking the champagne bottle. Uh, and, and letting this thing go here, so. Eddie, one quick question from the chat. Are there plans to have more transparency on the website to add construction year, partial history information, et cetera, like Pima County has done? Yes, uh, that is part of our initiative is to, again, have more transparency of, of data uh, that that we have be available to the public. And again, uh, that, that is one of our initiatives. We would like to be the leader here in Arizona. So, you know, that, that's going to be a goal for us. <laughs> 